Okay, and Lisa, go ahead and take it away and pick up where we left off. Okay, great. Sorry, just trying to find the chat window. Okay, so before the break, um, I talked about kind of all of our um, wet lab work and sampling um, leading up to sequencing. And so now I'll talk about our um, analysis workflow. And so what we get from our sequencing vendors um, are raw FASTQ files. And our first step is to remove human reads. Um, we do get a big, a big portion of our samples um, were um, human reads. And um, following that, we did quality trimming and adapter removal. Now, you guys are all very familiar with that now uh, with Trimomatic. And um, we performed taxonomic classification um, using Kraken 2 and Bracken. Um, and actually, this. Um, tool that we use, Kraken 2 and Bracken, was selected um, based on um, some summer work um, that we did with some HPU students, uh, I think a couple summers ago. Um, I think Mike and Parag um, were part of that effort. Um, and so they took some um, control data and some previous sequencing data, um, ran them through several um, classifiers and took a look at kind of the results and processing time and the efficiency um, and determined that uh, Kraken 2 was the uh, best one to use for our samples. And so um, from there, we got our taxonomic results in the form of kind of counts tables um, at the species level. And um, our data analysis involved uh, doing statistics and data visualization um, up from those counts tables. And for the next couple of slides, I'm going to go into um, uh, kind of what we did to optimize um, the Kraken 2 Bracken program specifically for our samples. Um, and so Kraken is a uh, taxonomic sequence classifier. And what it does, it assigns taxonomic labels um, to short DNA reads um, or KMERS. And so what it does is that, that there's a Kraken database um, where it has um, KMERS and assigned taxa um, to every single KMER within that database. And so what we're doing is taking our samples, breaking it down to KMERS, and then mapping to that database. And one of the things um, that really affected kind of our results was the confidence score that you would set for uh, Kraken 2. And so we found that, you know, if you change the confidence score even a little bit, it really changes your results. And so what we did is we um, decided which confidence score we would use on our samples with simulated metagenomes. Um, and so we would simulate metagenomes using a silico seq um, to kind of to be as close to our um, samples as possible to kind of understand the bioinformatic processing noise that would be generated um, from this classifier and determine kind of what would be the best confidence score that we could have to decrease noise. And so um, this work was done by um, my intern from uh, last year, uh, Shireen, and she what she did was she created a simulated metagenome with 25 bacterial species. And the species that she used were the most commonly found um, in our clean room facilities um, that we know of. Um, so from previous uh, metagenome data and from our just kind of preliminary analysis um, without setting any type of confidence uh, score um, with our actual GI samples. Um, and so she created that using in silico seq, which is a sequencing simulator. Um, she set it to 5 million reads per sample with a high seq error model and assuming uniform abundance. And so what the confidence score is actually doing is it is just looking at the number of KMERS mapped to the lowest common ancestor. Um, in a taxonomic tree and the number of KMERS in a sequence 
that don't have an ambiguous nucleotide. And so what that means, if we have an example here, is um, let's say in our sample, we have 13 KMERS that map to Bacillus subtilis from the Kraken database. And we have four KMERS that map to just Bacillus, um, which is which was the least common ancestor that, low, sorry, lowest common ancestor that it mapped to, did it map at the species level. And the next 31 KMERS contained an ambiguous nucleotide. So in sequencing, it was an ATG or C, it had an N. Um, and so those were, uh, uh, ambiguous nucleotides put in a different bin. And one KMER was not in the database at all. And so what the confidence score will do is um, for Bacillus subtilis, it would uh, say that 13 KMERS mapped to Bacillus subtilis out of 18 total that did not have an ambiguous nucleotide. And for Bacillus, it would be the 13 plus four, so 17, um, so for anything that mapped to Bacillus subtilis or just Bacillus over 18. And so if we specified a threshold above 13 over 18, then Bacillus subtilis would be adjusted to Bacillus. So any read that we had that were previously mapped to Bacillus subtilis with a 13 over 18 um, confidence score would actually just be called Bacillus. We wouldn't have that species level ID. And if we specified a threshold above 17 over 18, um, then the sequence would become unclassified. That's quite high. So an example of the confidence scores that we used is um, if we did not set a confidence score at all, then our simulated metagenome of 25 species came back as um, 170 species. So it'd be a lot of false positives. Um, and so what we ended up going with because um, we also didn't want to go too high. We found that if we actually went higher than 0.15, we would start losing our actual um, species. So we would start getting false negatives. Um, and so 0.15 was kind of the sweet spot where we did get false positives because we did get 44 species when we only expected 25. Um, but we still saw all 25 uh, true positives. And so this score is what we ended up using. Um, and so the, this is a um, NMDS plot, which now I'm blanking on what M NMDS actually stands for, <laughs> um, but it is showing kind of the relationship or the similarities between two samples. Um, and so a green circle is our actual hardware sample. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> Non-metric, multi-dimensional scaling. Um, our uh, red samples are negative controls. Our blue samples are our handling controls. And so what we see here is that we have a lot of overlap um, between, specifically between our sample and our handling control. Um, this was actually post confidence score application. So I actually, I don't have one showing the actual, um, what it was, I should have included in here, but what it was. Um, oh, Rachel has a question about how Kraken2 compares to other tools like Megan in your data. That's a great question. Well, the reason why we went with Kraken2 over Megan is because it is just so much faster. Um, Megan was, I think it took, I don't remember the exact time, but Kraken2 took, I think a couple of minutes. It was in the scale of you know, a couple of minutes per sample compared to Megan, which would take hours. Um, yeah, it was, yeah, Megan can be slow. Right. Thanks, Mike. So Mike said that Megan requires blast as input. That's the slow part. So it's alignment based. Where's Kraken is camera based. Um, so this is actually post confidence score. Whereas before when we had no confidence score, the overlap was even more significant. Um, and so what we see here is that we still see some similarities and overlap um, 
in species composition between our handling controls and our samples. And so the next thing that we did was we used decontam. And so decontam is a software that will actually just look at the absence and presence of um, IDs within a sample and statistically remove any contamination that um, is present consistently across a lot of samples and across controls. And so it's kind of identifying um, what are the things that are showing up consistently and removing them from our actual samples. And so when we did that, then of course, then we see that um, our samples and handling control and negative controls um, it no longer overlapped. And so it was important for us to remove this because let's say that we actually apply this for um, developing um, requirements for hardware contamination. You know, it is very time consuming and also resource consuming to go to our engineers and tell them, well, this part that you have assembled um, that is now already assembled is too dirty, take it apart, re-clean, we got to resample, we could potentially be looking at schedule delays um, of weeks if we were to do that. And so we want to make sure that any contamination that we're identifying, um, that we're, we're confident in that, that we can actually tell them, okay, this is a concerning organism that we're finding, please clean it. And so, um, as I mentioned earlier, we uh, also we sequenced a lot of uh, positive controls. Um, and so our positive control was a, it was just the Zymo mix of, um, I think 10 bacterial and fungal species. And so what we saw here, so this is just the raw species abundance without applying any confidence score or applying decontam. And so you see that, and this is the con concentration on the x-axis and relative abundance on the y-axis. And as we expect, um, as concentration decreases, this is you know sub picogram levels. We didn't actually even sequence anything in in, in these areas, um, but this was part of our pilot study with Fulgent. That um, as we get lower down in concentration, you know your sample is overwhelmingly no longer what you expect. Um, and so, however, when we did apply um, the confidence score that we found through the simulated metagenome and decontam, um, the constant, we were able, at least in the highest concentrations, to really minimize um, the species that we did not expect to find. And so here are just some results that we had from our uh, hardware. Um, this is just in total number of species um, from various different areas of, of hardware. That's picograms per microliter. Uh, that's a good question for here. I think for library prep, they took five microliters for library prep. And then, so what, where we're, what we're seeing on our um, actual spacecraft samples is um, anywhere between you know 10 to 50 um, species per sample. And so this chart is a lot, but just some things to point out is that the um, this is at the genus level just for uh, representation's sake. Um, what we are we are finding just a lot of common bacteria that you know we we seen from previous studies, such as Cynodobacter and Pseudomonas. It is, however, different than what Armand showed earlier when we do NASA standard assay is we're seeing that, you know, Bacillus is not one of um, the most common uh, genera that we find when we do um, metagenomics. And so here's some lessons learned that I just want to share to recap when we um, think about how we can actually apply this to a future mission. Um, first thing is it would be great if we can improve our sampling method to increase the yield. Right now we're kind of restricted to our cotton swab and polyester wipe. 
which although they do work and they're approved and um, they're not necessarily the most efficient um, because we do lose um, efficiency in uh, the swabbing and the dissociating. Um, I think it's very actually very hard to remove things from the cotton matrix of a cotton swab. And so if we could look at alternatives such as peels or tapes um, or something dissolvable, um, we could improve kind of our initial input, which would then really help with all of our downstream work from there. Um, our sample size to results turnaround time is currently too long due to batch size requirements. So since we don't have in-house sequencing, we can't just sequence whenever we want. Um, if we if we could get, you know, for example, the nanopore um, up and running for, for this, that would be great because then it's not too expensive to just run a few samples at a time. Um, but right now, the results turnaround time is way too long um, for even if it takes only a week, which would be, you know, best case scenario, that is too long um, for actually determining uh, compliance for hardware. And um, so the idea is that we can complement metagenomics based method with a rapid quantitative method, um, such as qPCR or what would be even better would be digital droplet PCR. Um, and so digital droplet PCR, for example, it would be great because we can do targeted amplification without the amplification bias, since it is um, splitting each qPCR sample into tens of thousands of tiny droplets, um, and the reaction happens within the droplets. And then we can break that emulsion, um, and digital PCR product can be used for sequencing. And so um, the idea here do we have access to a digital droplet PCR? I have access to half a digital droplet PCR. I had enough money to buy half of the system to actually generate the droplets, um, but I did not have enough funds to uh, buy the reader. And so um, we've been uh, kind of collaborating with a lab in Caltech um, that can help us actually read um, our samples. Gotcha. Caltech is closer, but um, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. We have a digital droplet PCR um, at Ames. Oh, cool. I'm very jealous. Um, it, it's been my goal for a few years now to to have the whole system so that we can actually try this out um, and do some extensive uh, kind of VNV with it. Uh, so far, we've only tested a few samples. And so the idea would be, you know, ha use PCR to tell us okay it is um you know clean enough to proceed and use then use metagenomics for comprehensive identification and any downstream functional analysis um, but at least we can kind of have that initial um i guess idea of how clean the spacecraft is and if it's just like um unacceptably dirty and so what we other thing is we learned that simulated metagenomes can help determine data processing parameters for unique data sets like ours and um, extensive controls are needed for quality filtering and interpreting process contamination and false positives. Um, so it is expensive to have so many controls, but in order for the data to be meaningful, um, we actually did need to, the controls. And so, um, yeah, any questions? Huge thanks to um, every all past uh, GI team members um, and the Mars 2020 project for allowing us to um, do this on the spacecraft and the Mars program office um, funded uh, our efforts. Save references and any questions? I think there was. Have we compared amplicon sequencing to metagenome sequencing to determine how accurate Kraken 2 is for taxonomic inference? We have not. That would be interesting. What I'm, I'm really interested in specifically pairing digital PCR with amplicon sequencing. Um, I think if, if we get a chance, that would be the next thing that I would do so that it, it would, um, we can kind of fill in the gaps in the workflow. Any other questions? Stop sharing. Yeah.
so first, thanks, Armand and Lisa. That was great. Um, and Lisa, awesome walkthrough example of the Kraken confidence scoring. Uh, that thanks. was very helpful. Um, I was wondering about the read depth, and more specifically the coverage. And this could be a question for you or Armand um, that you guys are getting for the isolates that you sequence. So I think it was mentioned you keep them in their own lane, which of course makes sense, but that might be resulting in super high coverages, which can actually hinder assembly. So for example, uh, for a typical bacterium, like 100x coverage results in a really high quality assembly, but 1000x coverage will actually make a highly, highly fragmented assembly. I was wondering if you folks see high numbers like that and deal with it or not. I think that's a question for our month. That's actually very interesting, Mike, because I have a handful of genomes that have very high coverage, and I've been trying to wrap my head around why the assembly is so horrible. And I think you just gave me the answer. Yeah, man, do digital normalization on them and you'll be blown away. I went through a similar thing and I was completely surprised. It's a little counterintuitive that more coverage leads to a worse assembly. I don't think anyone knows the exact mechanism, but it's like easy to conceptually think, well, we're allowing more errors in there overall. And we're increasing the probability that some errors will actually overlap, even though they're rare. And in my right. head, at least that's what helps me sleep, assuming that's what causes it. But when you see it yourself at first, you'd be like, wow. <laughs> no, it's really interesting. Um, for a majority of the, the isolates that we sent for whole genome, at least, um, we got back around 50 to 70 X coverage and, and those assemblies look pretty good. Um, yeah. But. Well, yeah, it's interesting. I'll definitely look into those. Let's also throw in the comment that um, I feel Rachel's questions about um, Kraken comparing to others. I'm not really a fan of, of Kraken either. Uh, and actually, I'm not a fan of any short read classifiers. I think we're asking them to do a pretty impossible task and we want a lot of data out of it. Um, and that's fine, we, we gotta pull out what we can. But generally speaking, like Lisa mentioned, uh, they stick with the camera approach because it's fast and very practical. Um, but I, all things being equal, I would probably go with uh, a BLAST approach for Diamond, as Rachel mentioned, which is light years faster than BLAST. Um, and then do like something like Megan or anything that agglomerates the results. Um, but yeah, for large scale operations, I also, also think it's very reasonable to just use Kraken. Yeah, I think it also depends on the microbial communities um, and how complex they are and how unusual they are. Yeah. You're right, if they're not represented at all, Kraken is not gonna pick up anything, but blast will still. Yeah, exactly. Still. And, and usually when we're using any type of short read classifier, we we just, use our class uh, cutoff classifications at uh, order uh, order or family because mm -hmm. we're not confident at all in anything um, more you know any higher resolution yeah same yeah one thing we've also done if we've had uh, uh, high enough high enough depth is that we'll just pull out the 16s sequences um, like specifically the the variable regions that people usually use when they're doing amplicon sequencing. So our results are directly, and then use only those for classification. And so our results are um, more comparable to the amplicon studies that people typically use. Yeah, that's interesting. We're straight from the reads you're saying, right? Yep. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, it works pretty well if you've got a deep metagenome. Yeah, I asked actually, about the reads for anyone else is curious because the assembly part usually won't show much 16s because there's so much similarity but slight differences so assemblers can't really assemble them um, yeah. but the information should be in the reads that's why i asked about that sorry Armand. no all good um we actually did a similar thing with the whole genomes we pulled out the 16s to see if there was any concurrence between the id we were getting with just the 16s versus like ani or um the gtdb tk based ids for the most part there was agreement but there was some that weren't um and we i mean right now i'm at the junction of we have to submit these genomes to ncbi and ncbi will not accept um a gtdb tk based id 
but um, or an ANI based ID. I mean, they have their own sort of uh, approach for um, identification, and so uh, reconciling the differences between 16S and whole genome based ID has been uh, difficult. <laughs> Never an easy question. Um, back to the your Rachel, your question about Megan versus Kraken. Um, I think when we when we did the comparison, um, because of how much we and had to clean up in the end, um, if you look the chart that I showed of the actual you know number of species that we found per sample was between ten and fifty which is, you know, really not that many. Um, it ended up, you know, when we had to kind of clean it up to that level, kind of like what you were saying with just being able to do family level IDs, you know, we found that there really wasn't much difference um, because anything that didn't show up in very high abundance, we couldn't say that it, it was actually there or, you know, didn't want to say that it was there without um, high confidence. And especially compared to the controls, because you just get so much from the controls. Yeah. Mike, when you mentioned BLAST and, and using, like, I'm assuming you're saying just that NCBI database, do you ever run into like quality issues and the fact that uh, it's not curated and there's just a ton of um, junk in there? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, there's a, I, I know tech, uh, NCBI does run things through their system and it'll put whatever taxonomy it looks like to them, but people can also submit whatever taxonomy they want for things. I'm actually having trouble reconciling that those two things exist right now, but for sure, um, anything genome level, I, I only trust GTDBTK because it's actually phylogenetically based uh, entirely, well, not entirely, but largely. Um, and other than that, any database, yeah, I expect problems and things are wrong. So nothing is ever right and nothing is ever done. It's outputs from inputs. I don't like to say garbage in, garbage out, because even when you give it good stuff, you're still not getting the right answer. You're just getting stuff out. So I say outputs <laughs> from inputs. And yeah, the, every database is wrong. <laughs> we just got to do our best. Yep. There's another question in the chat um, from Wei Jin. Will any of these sequencing technologies eventually replace the spore asset in your assembly facility? Um, so, <laughs> maybe one great day. question. Hopefully, one day. <laughs> maybe one day. <laughs> um, so, I think we are moving closer in that direction because um, in for our Mars missions, the planetary protection requirements are uh, spore quotas. So we cannot launch with more than 300,000 spores total on a spacecraft. And so that's really easy with a spore-based assay, just kept spores. Um, it gets difficult with um, our missions to, you know, ocean worlds like Europa Clipper or maybe Europa Lander, um, where the requirement becomes a probability. So our planetary protection requirement in those missions are that the your probability of contamination for the entire mission um, has to be less than 10 to the minus four. Um, <laughs> Europa Lander, yeah, hopefully one day. <laughs> it's what I work on. <laughs> um, and so the probability has to be less than uh, one in 10,000 of any single organism, doesn't matter if it's a spore or a vegetative cell, um, like if, if that makes it to the, an icy world, you know, liquid, it's actually, about, if it contaminates the ocean, um, then we fail our planetary protection requirements. And so then we kind of have to show that, you know, we can't just be looking at spores anymore. Um, and so I think that with the, the technology is going to have to evolve, especially since the requirements have evolved changed and yeah like lisa's saying with like ngs sequencing technology metagenomics and any of that um the requirement needs to be completely restructured like we yeah. the difficulty is uh, like she was saying the spore requirement is 10 to the 4 what does that translate to when you're looking at reads or um metagenomic uh like e the whole genome uh sequences 
Um, we don't know what that number would be or what that translation would look like. Um, I think that's the biggest difficulty right now, at least. And that's also probably, mentioned. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm on. You finish. No, no, no. All good. <laughs> uh, I also imagine, you know, some spores won't lice. So I can see a world where you don't get rid of the spore assay either, because you may not be able to sequence them. Yeah, that's true. It's also hard to get rid of the spore assay because it's it's relatively really fast, right? Like within 72 hours, we can have a result. Um, and another thing that's great about it is that you can get a zero, <laughs> even though it's inefficient, even though you're missing a lot of stuff, you get a zero and people like seeing that. Um, it's it's kind of hard to explain, you know, when you do sequencing, like, oh, well, you know, you also see a bunch of other stuff and your controls have a bunch of other stuff. Um, the interpretation of it gets tricky. Yeah, like I'm getting 10,000 reads back from the sample, but yeah. it's okay, you can still launch. You know? Yeah. Very hard to convince people of that. Oh, we humans, we're so silly. But a less sensitive <laughs> assay tells us zero. Excellent. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, on the, the other proving the uh, or convincing the other side is also difficult of uh, saying, hey, I, I got one read uh, from some uh, really dangerous, potentially dangerous organism. Um, the question becomes, well, are you sure that organism is there? Do you know what it's doing there? Is it alive? Is it possible to actually survive the, the sort of interplanetary uh, mission. Um, so I think the difficulties are on both sides. Any other questions? No? Okay, well, thank you guys. Um, what's next on the schedule? Thanks so much, Lisa and Armin, for giving us a nice overview of some of the awesome work you guys are doing at JPL. Um, and also for the great questions uh, and discussions. So with that, we're going to switch gears again um, and hop back into our RNA-seq processing uh, where we left off yesterday. So um, Lauren, uh, take it away. I'll put the we're going to run up our SMC instances. I put the link in the chat again. Go ahead, Lauren. Thank you, Amanda. Yeah, so for anyone who doesn't have the SMC instance up and running, please go ahead and start it using the link that Amanda put in the chat. Make sure to click small server on demand. And I'm going to share my screen here. So once you have your server up and running, please make sure that you have the um, DG, RNA-seq DG Jupyter Notebook open. And, and we're going to have to run through all of, um, all of the cells that we ran previously because we need to get those variables um, to do the last two visualizations. So can you all please let me know in the chat once you have your server going and your notebook up? Just say ready or something. Nice, thank you, thank you. So while we're waiting on everyone's servers, I'm going to just, um, I'm sharing my screen and showing the workflow for the differential gene expression analysis. So just as a reminder, um, we created our DC data set object using raw counts and sample metadata. We looked at a PCA of the raw counts and looked at the separation between um, biological conditions and then between the technical replicates. 
We then perform size factor estimation using DSeq2 median of ratios method. And we again looked at the PCA and noted how our biological, uh, the principal component that accounts for biological difference had grown, whereas the principal component that accounts for technical difference had shrunk, which is exactly what we want to see after removing technical aspects um, of the data. We then also estimated gene dispersions, and we talked about how at um, very low levels of expression, gene variability or dispersion is very high because um, the RNA sequencing assay is um, quite variable and noisy at low expression levels. Then um, we performed hypothesis testing uh, using the WALD test, where we tested both of our contrasts, flight versus ground control and ground control versus flight. And we then iterated through those contrasts to get the um, adjusted p-value, p-value, log two-fold change, and the WALD statistic. We pasted all that together into a DG table and added multiple different types of gene annotations. We also added some more statistics like mm -hmm. mean and standard deviation of all samples or within groups. And now we're at the visualization portion where we've just created a PCA plot um, with our only our 773 differentially expressed genes. And just as we expected, the PCA, uh, the principal component that accounts for biological variability is now accounting for a huge portion of variation in the data set. So the next step will be to create a heat map and a volcano plot using our differentially expressed genes. So is everyone still waiting on their server? I only heard from uh, three people. Are the servers taking a long time to start up today? Can I ask a question um, about PC1 and PC2? How did you know that one was a biological influence and one was a technical influence? Yeah, that's a good question. So I'm going to scroll down in my notebook. Um, for those of you who are still waiting, you can just follow along on my screen. So when um, we made our first PCA plot, so this is this with the raw unnormalized data, Um, we um, colored the plot by biological condition. So um, just visually from looking at the plot, I was able to tell which principal component had to do with biological condition because I can look at the x-axis and I can say, okay, that's PC1, the y-axis represents uh, PC2. So any spread along these um, principal component um, axes means that the separation between points along that direction of the axis um, is so the separation of points along that axis direction represents um, separation that is explained by that principal component. So when I look at principal component one, the main source of separation that I can see explained by the metadata that we've imprinted on this plot is separation on the biological condition. So from that I deduce, so PC1, the variability explained by PC1 is mainly biological variability. So I'm putting together um, stuff I can see on the graph with stuff I already know about this experiment, like biological condition. Then when I look at, yeah. Is it always going to separate where one is a biological influence and one is a technical influence? No. It's not. This is a very nice and straightforward um, data set where it, there is a clean separation on biological um, influence. So this is what, it's nice to see this in kind of a nice straightforward data set because this is what you would like to see. If you have a strong biological signal um, and there isn't a lot of other technical artifacts, this is what um, it would be nice to see. If you don't see this, it would tell you that you, whatever biological signal in your data is less strong than the other signals that are causing the variability um, that are influencing PC1 and PC2. <clears throat> gotcha, thank you. Um, yeah, so then I, I was also going to mention, so if I look at PC2, 
the separation um, vertically here is not separating on biological condition. The biological conditions are separating um, horizontally, not vertically. So when I look vertically, I think, okay, there's some other source of variation that is uh, in the data that is explained by PC2. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Well, this is why we're using this data set because there isn't a lot of head scratching going on with this data set. It's it's very nice, very straightforward. Um, and if you know like what this looks like, then with a more complex data set, it can be um, a nice comparison. Okay. So see some people are still waiting. Okay, ready? Good. Thank you, Susie. Wachin, are you still waiting as well? And Akemi. Okay, is anyone still still waiting? Sorry, that might be an easier question. Okay, great. All right, in that case, we're going to have to run through all of these code blocks again, um, starting with importing the R libraries that um, we, are, we require to do all of this analysis. Um, then, Remember, we set up directory path variables and imported our sample metadata, formatted it specifically, and created the contrasts, flight versus ground control, ground control versus flight, and stored um, the raw counts in a variable called raw counts. We then created a DC data set object after um, converting all of the raw counts to integers using the ceiling function. And we then filtered our um, DC data set object to only keep genes with row sums greater than 10, which left us with um, about 22,000 genes. We then created um, a PCA plot using the unnormalized data. So that's what we were just looking at. And we saved, saved that plot locally. Well, not locally, but into your home directory on SMCE. We made two plots, one with label and one without, and then wrote out all of the PC values to a PCA tape. We then ran estimate size factors to perform median of ratios normalization. We also estimated dispersions and borrowed information across genes across the entire data set. We looked at the dispersion estimates, and this is what I was talking about when I went over the uh, workflow. Dispersion is, is high when gene expression is low because RNA sequencing is noisy at low expression levels. We then ran the hypothesis test, walled test, to um, for, for every gene. We're testing the hypothesis this gene is differentially expressed between group one and group two, where group one and group two are dictated by those contrasts that we set up, flight and ground control or ground control versus flight. We um, grabbed the normalized counts matrix after um, <clears throat> normalizing with median of ratios. We took a look at a PCA plot after normalization, and we saw that PC1 now explains 20% of the variance, whereas before it explained 18 and PC2 went down from 11, from 13 to 11. So after normalization, our biological signal is stronger and our technical signal is weaker, which is perfect. <clears throat> Played around with the plots a little bit. Then we started building our DG output table by first grabbing the normalized counts data. That's, that's the beginning of our uh, DG output table. You can look at the first, so that, that's 12 uh, columns. 12 samples and row names are ensemble gene IDs. We then iterated through the walled tests to generate pairwise comparisons of all the groups. 
And here we are collecting log full change, log to full change, the walled statistic, the p-value, and the adjusted p-value for each of these contrast comparisons, <clears throat> adding those into the table. Then um, we calculated mean across all mean expression across all samples for each gene and mean standard deviation for all, all samples for each gene, added those to the DG output table. So we're basically building this table um, out with helpful metrics that we might use for analysis. So we can look at the columns we added, the uh, four walled test statistic, um, the four walled test metrics, and then uh, all mean and all standard deviation. And we then calculated um, mean and standard deviation within the two groups, so within flight and within ground control. And we added those into the DG output table. And then we took a look at the final DG output table, um, which has four more columns at, at the end, group mean, group standard deviation. And then we finally, we added in gene annotations. So <clears throat> we access this organism table, which has the correct annotations database for each organism. And so that this code is we can easily run the following code without having to note down the organism that we use every time. We set up a variable that corresponds to the organism name within this organism table. So we can then just search that organism table, grab the correct annotations database, load it into R, and add annotations from there. So we then built an annotation database. We you just use that library function to load in the correct annotations database based on the organism that we're using. Uh, by the way, <clears throat> as I'm doing this, if you're following along, um, my uh, code up here is still running, calculating the group means and standard deviations. So I'm just clicking through and adding on new code blocks that will that are in the queue to be run after that code block is done so that I don't have to do that <clears throat> in, so I don't have to wait for this code block to be done I'm just going through and clicking so everything with an asterisk by it will run automatically once that uh, group means and group standard deviation code block is done running hmm. right so then we searched through the annotation database and we mapped um, different types of gene annotations onto our existing ensemble annotations. So we got gene symbol, gene name, ref seek, and entree ID. And we took a look at the an little annotations table that we were building out. We have our ensemble column, we have a symbol column, gene name, ref seek, entree ID. So all of these have been mapped onto ensemble. So you can see, by the way, um, finally that code block stopped running. So all of the code blocks I had in the queue finished running. So they have a number instead of an asterisk, which is great. Take a look at the annotations table, yep. <clears throat> and then we access the string database to collect protein-protein interactions that contain um, any, for every gene, find any protein-protein interaction that that gene is involved in, if that gene codes for a protein. And we also access the Panther database to collect um, GoSlim IDs, and GoSlim IDs are um, a gene ontology identifiers. So a list of genes correspond to a biological function. And then we took a look at our um, annotations table. Um, we just looked at the very first row because after adding in the GoSlim IDs, each row is very tall. So looking at more than one row on the screen would be difficult. So you can see, again, using we start with ensemble. We have our different gene annotation IDs, string IDs, and go slides. All right. And then we um, stitched the annotation table together with the DG output table and took a look at that final DG output table, which now has um, a gene ID, string, go slim, all of our samples and their gene counts our uh, wall test statistics and the metrics at the end. So we've basically built a, um, we've basically built a, a table that has useful annotations, 
gene counts for each sample, and uh, differential gene expression analysis results. Right, the final thing that we did then was to write out files saving the contrasts that we used as input to DC2. So we can always refer back to those. And um, we wrote out our large DG output table to a CSV file called differential expression CSV. All right, so then finally, getting into the data visualization portion, we log transformed the norm counts variable. So this is a data frame holding our normalized counts matrix. We had to add a pseudo count, which is adding plus one so that we don't get, we don't have to take the log of zero. Saved that in an X norm, <clears throat> an X norm uh, variable. And then we, um, since our DG output table has all genes, in it, we want to just filter down to those genes according to adjusted p value and log twofold change. We just want to get those genes that are significantly differentially expressed. So we filter down our differentially expressed genes to just the genes that have an adjusted p value from the wall test of less than 0.05 and a log twofold change um, absolute value greater than one. So these are accepted practices for identifying significantly differentially expressed genes. So that's what this code block does. It accesses the columns that hold the adjusted p-value and log twofold change, does some filtering, removes any rows with an NA, and then we took a look at the dimensions of our filtered DG table, 773 differential expressed genes, so it's pretty good. And um, then <clears throat> since this is the DG output table, it has lots of those extra statistical columns and annotations. So I also subset our log transformed normalized counts table, which just has the samples and the counts. I subset that also just to differentially expressed genes because that's what we'll use for the heat map. And then we made a PCA plot using the um, counts that have been subset just to differentially expressed genes. And we noted that PC1 has increased to explaining 56% of the variance in the data now, which makes sense because we're specifically selecting for genes that will increase um, or that define the separation between flight and ground control. So it makes sense that this is the dimension that it now holds uh, the majority of the variance in the data. All right. <clears throat> So that brings us to new material for today. We're going to make a heat map. So I went over heat maps in the lecture. Um, remember, uh, heat maps are just a way of visualizing using a color map, visualizing the values from a matrix. We also discussed scaling to make it easier to visualize relative expression levels. <clears throat> um, and um, so here, what we're going to do is we're going to scale the counts data between 0 and 1. So this is going to make it easier to visualize uh, relative expression levels. So this is just some math. This is min-max scaling where um, we're just um, taking the, uh, val the largest and smallest values in our differentially expressed genes expression matrix and um, scaling the entire matrix and saving that into a new variable called xdge scale. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and run this cell. And we're going to use the complex heat map um, library in R, which gives us this function just called heat map. And we're going to create a heat map by passing in our scaled uh, expression data. We're not I'm going to show row names. So row names here be genes. We have almost 800 of those that wouldn't be readable. So show row names equals false. But we are going to give a row title because we want to um, show that our the row is DGEs um, and there are 773 of them. And then we're adding a legend titled scaled expression. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and run this cell. You'll notice we got a little pink warning um, telling us that the input was a data frame and saying convert it to a matrix. Um, I never feel the need to convert a data frame to a matrix before running this function because they do it for me. <clears throat> 
So I just ignore this warning. All right, so <clears throat> here's our heat map. As you can see on the left-hand side, y-axis, these are our differentially expressed genes. So each row is a gene here with expression level, uh, scaled expression level colored by this continuous legend uh, color map here from zero to one. Zero is blue, one is red. And the, um, our, sa our samples are in columns here and those we did allow to have um, names or labels because there are only 12 of them. So you can also see that the genes and samples have both undergone hierarchical clustering so that genes with similar expression uh, patterns are clustered together and samples that have similar gene expression patterns are close together. <clears throat> All right, so before we um, think a little bit about this heat map, let's generate the heat map again, but this time we're gonna save it to a variable called heat map with a little h because um, we then are going to save it to a PDF at your uh, DGE plots directory. And um, in order to do that, we had to have the heat map saved as a variable rather than print it to the screen using the save PDF function. All right, so let's go ahead and just take a look at this heat map and ask what overall trends do you notice in the expression of the DGEs in the samples within the same group or different groups, where groups here means flight and ground control. So this is, there's, you know, no right, no wrong answer here. This is a very kind of descriptive, interpretive question, but I'd be interested to hear um, what you guys think looking at this heat map. And please answer this question in the Mentimeter. I need a few more seconds, make sure everyone has a chance to answer. All right, nice. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and stop the voting. Thank you so much, everyone. Great, thoughtful answers. So, um, otter in the upper areas of the graph and colder lower areas, yep. Expression patterns are quite similar, not surprising given it's the same tissue, but there are groups of genes that stand out as different, similar for each group. Light has those two outlier samples in the bottom left again. Yep. As DGs increase, so does the sample expression increase within the groups, and this trend seems to continue across groups as well. Patterns are similar within groups and different between groups. Samples within each condition are consistently differentially expressing the same genes, but they're not the same genes between conditions. Distinct separation between ground control and flight groups with flight one, two, and four showing some variation from the flight group. Within the same group, patterns of expression are very similar between the groups. Patterns differ. This is great for using strong bands with similarly expressed genes within groups and between groups. Hierarchical clustering segregates the two groups. Ground control flight creates more tiers of flight, while GC is more on par, more variation within the flight than ground control. Hotter genes cluster together. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. These are great answers. Okay, so yeah, like I said, no right, no wrong answer. Um, just kind of exploring the data using a heat map. Uh, so I have observed a lot of the same things that you guys observed in the answers. So um, I noticed, first of all, that the samples are clustered based on group via hierarchical clustering. And then um, similarly, that within the ground control group, um, the patterns of gene expression tend to be a little more homogenous than within the flight group. And there are some similarities between uh, ground control flight, but there are also some key differences. So one thing that I noticed um, was, for example, it seems like this set of genes here, um, you know, what, however many, 20 or 100 genes here, seem to have very low expression in the ground control samples um, compared to higher expression in all of the flight samples. And that seems to be relatively consistent within groups. So that would be kind of interesting if I were investigating this data set. Um, and then there's another set of genes here that seems to have higher expression in flight versus um, ground control 
But then that brings me to something that some of you also noted, which is that within, right, within the flight group, the expression of uh, the genes is not as homogenous as within the ground control group. And in particular, there are three uh, samples in the flight group that seem to be kind of doing their own thing. So flight rep one it has this little bunch of genes that is more highly expressed than any other sample, including the rest of the flight samples. Uh, same with this little band of genes and kind of up here as well. So really uh, kind of interesting there. And then um, the flight rep two and flight rep four are very similar to each other, very different from everyone else. So this band of genes has higher expression in these two samples than any of the other samples. So if we scroll back up to the PCA plot and maybe I rerun this plot and ask it to label the samples with their sample name, remember we can do this by setting within the auto plot function, we can set the label argument equal to true. Oh, I didn't, did I not rerun this today? All right, I think I may have missed rerunning this cell. So it, if you want to rerun the PCA plot right here at the beginning of section four, make sure that you also rerun the cell that defines the PCA underscore DG uh, variable using the PR comp function. Having done that, I ran both of these cells again, but I set label equal to true. Um, I just wanted to see what these two outlier flight samples were because we noticed these yesterday when we were making this PCA plot. And as you can see, yep, these are, this is rep two and rep four. And so they are clustering away from the other flight samples in the PCA plot. And we see that recapitulated in the heat map. And so we might even say that we've maybe identified some genes that might be responsible for that separation. Then what's this other weird sample, flight rep one? If we go back up to PCA plot again, Flight rep one is shifted to the left as compared to the other three flight samples. So again, some separation here. Um, <clears throat> all right, I think that is pretty much everything that I wanted to point out about this version of the heat map. Any final thoughts on interpreting this heat map? Great. Um, so now, um, recall that before generating this heat map, we first scaled the expression data. Let's use the following code block to see what the heat map looks like if you don't scale the data. So here's a challenge. Please go ahead and use the following empty code block to recreate the heat map using the unscaled expression data. Um, so just all you have to do is run this heat map function again um, up here, but instead of using the variable where we scaled the data, use the uh, variable where we hadn't scaled the data yet. I don't think that we have this in the Mentimeter, so please um, put your code into the chat um, if you're comfortable with that. Just feel free to share your code. So Mark, um, does this syntax uh, recreate this, this plot? Um, were all of these arguments saved? Um, I actually don't, don't know. Maybe they carry over, but, um, <clears throat> if you don't have, um, your row title, for example, or your heat map legend, you might want to rerun the heat map function and, and add all of the rest of these arguments. <clears throat> Yeah, you're right. It's actually kind of bare. I was going to fix that up right now. Thank you. I'm just going to take a look at this myself. See what it looks like. Yikes. Yeah, so because 
I didn't set uh, this argument uh, show row names equal to false. It tried to put the names of all of the genes here, and it's completely unreadable and quite uh, ugly to look at. And there is no um, legend label here, so we don't know what the legend uh, designates. Does anyone else have some code they'd like to share in the chat before I do this uh, myself on the shared screen? All right, let's go ahead and do this together. So I've just copied in the, the heat map command. Instead of using the scale data, I'm using the variable that holds the data before we scale it. So that's x underscore DGE. Show row names equals to false. Row title can stay the same, but I'm gonna change the legend instead of saying scaled expression because it's not scaled. So we're gonna say, I'm gonna actually say log expression because recall that we log transformed these data uh, right up here at the top. So we can go ahead and run this. <clears throat> All right, so taking a look at this plot, it um, visually looks very similar except that our uh, color um, scale is now going from 0 to 15 rather than 0 to 1 because the data are not scaled. So I just noted that these data were log uh, transformed and then scaled. Um, what if we don't log normalize the data? <clears throat> Spoiler alert, this crash is the kernel in the Jupyter Hub, so we're not going to do that. Um, we've generated the plot locally and provided it here. Um, <clears throat> so take a look at this plot. And in the Mentimeter, we have um, <clears throat> two questions, I guess. Um, why do you think that this crashed the kernel in the Jupyter Hub? So let's answer that question first. And then the next question will be, uh, do you think that this is a useful plot? So, yeah, so th with that in mind, let's go ahead and stop voting and think about this together. So, yeah, so not enough computing power, the range would be too wide to see the difference, it would crash the kernels, the numbers would be too large, too many numbers, data is so dispersed it can't cluster the genes. So this is all, yeah, kind of getting at um, my theory as well, which is that um, there are a couple of things here. So as you can see, um, our expression values go all the way from 0 to 30,000. So my first idea is it is um, one of the requirements for this program is to assign each value to an infinitesimally different R um, GB value between you know dark blue and dark red. So breaking up those values um, is we now have many more um, this the split between blue and red is now has to be split into much smaller increments. So that requires a lot of memory and calculation. And the other thing, as somebody noted, is to perform this clustering, um, we might have made the job more difficult because there's very little uh, variation going on at the lower depths. All right, so with that in mind, is this a useful, what do you guys think? Is this a useful plot? All right, thank you everyone for answering. I'm gonna go ahead and close the voting now. So we have um, a little bit of a mixed bag of answers between people who agree with me and people who agree with Mike, um, just kidding. But so a lot of people say no, um, 
and or not really we do have someone you know yes this could still be an informative plot i'm assuming this is mike here you know my feelings on this so mike and i have had discussions about not calling plots useless and absolutely right so there absolutely there's still information here i would say we can improve on this plot there's a reason why i chose to log normalize and scale the data and show that you know is the first plot of course there's you know there's still information here we still had samples clustered there is still variation but i do think that it's very difficult to see the nice patterns that we were able to pick out in the original plot um, <clears throat> like if I wanted to look here and say, okay, can I look at a cluster of genes that really, you know, tells me the difference between fine ground control or even difference between flight samples or between ground control samples, I would have a hard time doing it from this particular plot. I also don't get the same sense of the fact that there might be some, you know, major technical um, batch effect going on here with two or three of the flight samples. So it's a little difficult to pick that out from looking at the the pattern, you can look at the clustering still, though. Uh, any final thoughts about heat maps? All right. Jill, I know you had uh, asked me a question about using the save.image function. I don't know if you want to unmute your mic and explain what you mean by that. Uh, yeah, sorry, I was just writing a response to that. So um, when you use R, you can, it automatically saves all environmental variables, objects, and everything in, it, in an R workspace, in a workspace work image. Um, but I was looking up through um, online posts that you can do this in Jupyter as well, where you put this little code, save image, and then every time you reload your kernel, everything will just stay there. So all you need to do is just run this little save image and all variables, all objects, all codes will stay there and you don't need to run the entire set of code every time you load up a Jupyter notebook. This is a fantastic point. Thank you, Joel. Um... We did play around with that for this workshop, and um, that would have been really useful today. Yeah. But for like yesterday when we had to rerun everything, we had intermediate versions of the variables that we want. So we wanted to like come to just one place and then stop and yeah. keep going. So yeah, I don't, maybe we should have like, like intermediate images. Um, for each, the beginning of each section. Well, I think maybe, Lauren, it would make sense to have that command maybe at the start where we have the note about rerunning. Um, and then that way we could just go over during the debrief section, wherever you end off at the end of the day, whoever's gonna be teaching this when you teach at your home institution, you could just copy and paste uh, that command at the location that you are when you stop for the day. And that way, when you bring it up the following day, it'll be where you ah, are. Ah, I see. I see. That's a great idea. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for the great idea. All right, so last 10 minutes before lunch, let's get started on the volcano plot. Um, okay, so Right, so volcano plot, scatter plot shows the relationship of the adjusted p-value in our case uh, to log pull change. So here we're not we're not subsetting just to the genes that we consider to be differentially expressed. We are looking at all genes, but we're putting those um, those barriers in to block off certain parts of the plot and, and plot genes based on whether or not they hit our log twofold change or adjusted p-value cutoff. <clears throat> so we're using a library in R called Enhanced Volcano, which provides us with the Enhanced Volcano function. So first we're going to use the default settings from this function, which you'll note are different from the settings that we just used to get differentially expressed genes for a heat map. Um, we're going to just use what comes as default, log twofold change cutoff, um, of greater than um, 
absolute value of 2 and adjusted p-value of less than 10 to the negative 6. And so you can read more about this function and see some examples by clicking on this hyperlink. And I've pre-populated this code block with the enhanced volcano function. We have to pass in the table with the uh, gene names and the log twofold change and the adjusted p-value column. So that's our DG output table, not our um, just our counts table. We're going to label the plot using the symbol column. Again, using that dollar sign operator to grab the symbol column from the DG out table. On the x-axis, we're doing log twofold change. On the y-axis, doing adjusted p-value and doing flight, the flight versus ground control comparison. We can set a title and legend labels. And then here's where you can play around with those um, default settings, p-value cutoff, um, full change cutoff, point size, label size, and alpha. And remember that alpha has to do with opacity. So since we have so many genes, I set opacity to 0.5 so we can get a nice plot. And then finally, we're saving a volcano plot to um, a PNG file using ggsave. So let's go ahead and run this cell and take a look at the volcano plot. So everyone should eventually get a volcano plot that looks like this. Let me know if you don't see this. So this is the title that I, I specified, flight versus ground control. We have negative um, log 10 p-value on the y-axis and log twofold change on the x-axis. Um, genes that passed, our, passed neither of our cutoffs are uh, non-significant, so those are gray. They're um, underneath the um, p-value threshold and in, in between or outside of the log twofold change thresholds. Genes that only pass log twofold change thresholds are in green here on the outside of, of those lines. Genes that only pass the adjusted p-value threshold are above this line, um, but uh, above the horizontal uh, p-value line, but inside of the log twofold change threshold lines. And then the any genes that pass both our thresholds are in red. And a few genes have been labeled here. So let's answer uh, the following questions, kind of interrogate this plot and see what we can learn from it. So first question, taking a look at the plot, which gene has the smallest adjusted p-value but still passes the log twofold change cutoff? So um, recall that we've taken the negative log of our adjusted p-value. So um, small adjusted p-value is large uh, negative log 10 p-value. <clears throat> so which gene has the smallest adjusted p-value and passes our log twofold change cutoff? And the answer on Mentimeter. Let's go ahead and stop voting and go over this together. So getting a few different answers here. Um, some people said Win to 9 b and some people said GM5532. So let's take a look at this plot again. So when I say smallest adjusted p-value here, um, <clears throat> A, a small adjusted p-value is good because it's significant, right? But when we make a volcano plot, we take the negative log of the p-value, or adjusted p-value in our case, because that makes the plot intuitive to read. Um, the negative log of um, an increasingly smaller set of numbers is going to get swapped and instead be a continuous um, number line um, increasing. So <clears throat> a gene with the smallest adjusted p-value is going to have the largest negative 10 adjusted p-value. So the um, <clears throat> gene with the smallest adjusted p-value or highest negative log 10 p-value is actually GM5532 um, and passing the log 2 full change cutoff. <clears throat> so Winch9b um, looks like it it literally does have the smallest negative log adjusted p-value, but um, smallest adjusted p-value corresponds to large negative 10 p-value. Um, are there any 
still confusion about this? Um, is this not clear to anybody? Any questions? Okay. All right, in that case, let's go ahead and take a break for lunch and we'll go over the rest of the questions and finish the notebook when we get back. Thank you so much, everyone.